The cool air of the spring evening greeted them as they left the merchant guild and descended the stairs to where the wagon awaited in the plaza below. Ludmilla flipped through the materials that she had received from the clerk briefly before returning to study the invoice template. The paper was more sturdy and thicker than a normal sheet would be, feeling slightly heavier in her hand, it was designed to be durable as a long-term reference to create duplicates from. She had a thought and turned to the elder lich. Are you able to create copies of this template? Ludmilla asked. She held out the sheet, and the elder lich immediately took it into its hand. Easily. The undead Atasha's raspy voice held no apparent emotion as it spoke, but the near instant reply gave the impression that it had scoffed at her question. I need five copies for this evening, she instructed her Atashi, and fifty additional forms by the morning. It faced forward and set about its task as the wagon rolled off towards its destination. The flutter of leathery wings turned Ludmilla's head towards the elder lich again as the imp alighted on its shoulder. She watched as her attaché held out a solid board that it had produced from somewhere to use as a writing surface. The imp deftly drafted the first copy not long after as the pair floated forward alongside the wagon. They studied the work together and, after finding the results satisfactory, continued their task. Is it really necessary to have that many copies at once? Lady Shiltia voiced her question as the shadows of the eastern quarter fell over them. They are for the residents in the city, my lady, Ludmilla replied, if my household needs to order anything or do any other business on my behalf, they will be able to use the account at the Merchant Guild if I prepare forms in advance. The manner of conducting transactions that the clerk described seems to have fewer faults than simply handing over a bag of coin to be kept in the manor. You don't trust your servants. Well, I have barely known them for a day, Ludmilla said, though even if they had earned decades of trust, the system in use by the guild still seems far more elegant overall in function. Out in the barony, there will be a need for funds on hand so it will be the usual methods there. The lives of humans seem filled with uncertainties, Lady Shildir shook her head. You cannot trust your servants and your purpose in life is undefined and seemingly ever-changing. You are able to always fully trust your servants, my lady. Of course. All the way down to the lowest being. They are bound to me, inextricably a part of my realm. Having them turn on me of their own will would be as inconceivable as your legs walking off without the rest of your body of their own volition. Deception in crucial matters is unthinkable, as is failure, Lady Shiltier's gaze observed the surroundings that they travelled through. Yet humans can ignore their obligations so easily. So few continue to function in this city, while the rest neglect their roles in your society to the eventual ruin of all. I've even witnessed those that would turn on their fellows, if only for a moment's reprieve from their hardships. Ludmilla listened quietly as her liege spoke. That everyone who served her could be treated with such confidence felt fantastically unrealistic. It was no small wonder that the Royal Council would be frustrated with the seemingly unreliable citizens of the Duchy if this was truly the case. Perhaps the Sorceress Kingdom would always look down on their human citizens, as the current issues were the result of human nature rather than any willful resistance or insubordination. It is difficult to refute your words with things as they are, my lady, Ludmilla said, though I had not realized there was such a difference between the human realms and your own. His Majesty shows great insight to have retained the laws of the realm, even when considering his existing vassals. Rather than have them directly dealing with the unfamiliar in an effort to manage the population directly, his decision allows those accustomed to the workings of their own to make changes smoothly. Then what am I to do with you, I wonder? Lady Shiltier turned her face towards Ludmilla, eyes glowing at her as they went from shadow to shadow, you are now mine, an odd vassal that does not quite fit in with the rest. Uncertain of where she now fit into the grand scheme of things, Ludmilla could not answer. In many ways, Lady Shiltier continued, you are much like me in your role as a frontier noble. You guard the realms of your liege in a roughly similar function as my own in defending His Majesty's realm. It can even be said that your burdens are far greater. You have not been gifted with great strength, nor vast intellect or powerful magic. Your domain does not possess strong fortifications or armies. You are ignorant of the world beyond your borders and you are pitifully weak, but you will toil and struggle and fight and die against any and all intruders that would come, as your house has done for generations. Yet, for all of these efforts, your names become as dust to those that reap the benefits of the peace that you win for their lands. In many other ways, you are different. You have ambitions beyond the immediate service to your liege, 
and you act as if it's a natural thing. You actively seek the strength of others with the understanding that you'll never truly be able to fully trust them. You are ultimately human, and bound to your human nature. Ludmilla was at a loss as her liege conveyed the evaluation. She thought Lady Shultier had followed her mostly to learn about the city and its workings as well as possible solutions to the predicament that it faced. Ludmilla had not realized that she herself was being carefully watched the entire time as well. For all of her strength and influence, the vampire had kept mostly to herself throughout the day as she had quietly observed her. She thought of the tales of another vampire, Landfall, and wondered if Lady Shultier's behavior was due to being a wise and perceptive cleric, a predator accustomed to stalking their prey, or perhaps both. Ludmilla pondered her liege's words, trying to find an answer they could both find satisfactory. My lady, the relationship between a vassal and their liege is maintained by contract. She began tentatively, for most nobles, especially those of the interior, it has become a sort of formal negotiation where those long established in their rule find agreeable terms between themselves. This contract, a pact of oath and obligation, duty and fealty, is the foundation of noble society and these realms by extension. It is the core of the relationship between liege and vassal, be they king and noble vassal, or landlord and tenant. Go on. Lady Shiltier had her chin in hand, looking up at Ludmilla as she spoke. Nearly two centuries ago, Ludmilla continued, when people came to settle the lands that would become Rias Ties and Baharuth today, there were no ties of blood, culture or trade that bound society together. There were only the leaders who established themselves over their people, carving out borders and defending their lands against any and all that would challenge the order that they sought to establish in the wake of the demon gods. These were the founders of the aristocracy of the human nations of the north, nobles not unlike the frontier nobles, great captains of men and militant in both mind and disposition. The most prominent houses became the march lords, many of which you still see holding these titles today, though they mostly no longer carry the same traditions as their ancestors. One house, the House of Vaiself, eventually unified the lands through diplomacy or war and the nobles who fell in line formed contracts between themselves and the throne. These contracts define the relationships between House Vaiself and their vassals, continuing down the hierarchy of administration to form the foundation of Rias ties. This contract, the oath of fealty between liege and vassal, is the core of what it means to be a noble of these lands, without it we are not much more than simple despots. So what do these contracts look like? Lady Shiltier asked. Well, I had thought to bring ours with us but decided to leave it at home since the duchy was fully ceded to an entirely new sovereign. That contract is effectively void now, but some may attempt to have old contracts ratified under their new liege in order to retain certain privileges from the previous government. I suppose since the transfer was so, clean, it would encourage at least a few to try. Ah, so that's what that was all about, her liege seemed to remember something. My lady. That noisy count. Lady Shiltier had a decidedly unimpressed look as she recalled the memory. Facet or something. Once it was clear that E. Rantle would see a bloodless transition, he came into the council chamber, bold as you please, demanding that his rights be recognized. As you might imagine, he got a rather cold reception, Cocytus flung him into the gate that I opened even as he continued shouting about it. Considering how hard he was thrown, he probably didn't survive the landing. I thought there was only one place where you could use teleportation spells in the central district. He came quite quickly. We were still implementing the framework for the government and finalizing security arrangements. The royal court did not even wait to hear him out, my lady. Oh, we did, Lady Shiltier said. He was very spirited, so we thought that this noble who had approached us before we even officially started our work must have possessed some merits. It was mostly preposterous, though, I think the disappointment added to his velocity. Then what did he say? Ludmilla asked. Hmm, a few things that should have been a given, faithful service, some amount of taxes, the pledge to provide a levy, tributes for special occasions. These are fairly standard in an oath of fealty, worries began to mount in Ludmilla's mind, though the details may vary. What did the royal council find offensive, exactly? Well. He did deliver it in a very loud and presumptuous manner, but there was also his list of demands. In addition to the guarantee of his title, he wanted ownership of the abandoned territories bordering his own. 
then there was the obligation to have His Majesty stand in his defense in court, as well as the full protection of all of his armies, the rights to enforce regulations upon the guilds and control over the western highway that ran through his fief. He went on for quite some time, but I lost interest partway, the man was clearly not going to survive his audience. It was a mix of demands that were mostly within the realm of reason, though the expansion of territory and control over the guilds was brazenly overreaching at best. Lady Corlin mentioned something about other nobles vanishing as well, Ludmilla said. Did they end up like Count Fassett? Not that I can remember, Lady Shultia said. Some fled their holdings after their audience, we didn't care to detain them since there was no point in keeping administrators who were willing to abandon their responsibilities. The remaining nobles were advised to avoid committing the same offense as Count Fassett. So none have attempted to reinstate old contracts or create new ones? Ludmilla frowned. Not a one, Lady Shiltier replied. Though I don't even see a point to your asking. Some of what Count Fassett either offered was what should already have been a given and he asked for the same. Everything else was anywhere from incomprehensibly greedy to outright blasphemous. It is still an integral part of a noble's life, Ludmilla said. Without it, the relationship between Vassal and Leech remains undefined and we are effectively without purpose. Some nobles need to add uncommon clauses to their contracts as well. Frontier nobles, for instance, pledge to protect the realm's borders. Since their territories are usually not that well developed, their liege is expected to put together a stipend from the other nobles in the domain that benefit from their protection in order to maintain security. Is that so unreasonable? No, not at all, Lady Shultier replied. But it is not rooted in selfish greed like the terms Count Fassett dared to push on His Majesty. So you would say that arrangements which are reasonable for the fief in question, or benefit the realm as a whole are acceptable? Of course, but you had better be prepared to provide an explanation if I ask. I think we should sit down together at some point and work this out, my lady. Ludmilla was still uncertain of what was safe to ask. I do not want to inadvertently add some clause that would result in being thrown to my death if I can avoid it. It can come after I have done all this though, I still do not know what His Majesty wants from the nobility for the long term. The Solita brought their wagon around a corner, where a large workshop of brick and stone occupied most of the city block. During their conversation, they could hear the sounds of the forge working out of sight as they approached from down the street, so the conversation invariably wound down. You're probably thinking too much, Lady Shultier said. You humans are weak, and military support in the fashion of your former arrangement means little to nothing. There are those that would say that being productive and paying your due is good enough. Ludmilla's heart sank at the words, and she shifted uneasily in her seat. Her original expectation when Momin had delivered the royal missive in Warden's Veil was that she would continue to carry on in the duties of House Zaradnik, much like how her family had served House Vaiself. However, nothing she could offer seemed to mean anything, indeed. The royal court's perception of what held value was foreign to her own. A gaping void in her identity had suddenly appeared, and there seemed to be nothing that she could fill it with. Lady Shiltier had described herself serving a similar role in the Sorceress Kingdom to her own, so Ludmilla was hoping that she would be able to empathize with her situation somewhat. And you, my lady? she asked, her hopes stimming, what do you think of this? In all honesty, I don't really see any point to it. Her liege answered, but it is his majesty's will to give humans their, space. His ways have ever always eluded us in their entirety, so perhaps there are some things that we may not understand or appreciate yet. Is Brunt Mesmit grumbled to himself as he walked up and down rows of pallets piled high with spears, tightening the ropes that secured the oil tarps laid over them. The hardened earth in the shadows of the makeshift lanes was still damp with the rain from the previous evening and he could see laden clouds once again rolling down over the distant foothills of the Azalizia Mountains to the north. He thought he heard the rumble of thunder carried on the evening winds and picked up the pace of his work, the last thing the shop needed was to have one of the protective covers ripped away by the storm winds and his inventories exposed to the deluge that was sure to come. After he was satisfied that everything was tied down properly for the night, he made his way back to the forge complex, stomping his heavy boots as he crossed the open yard in an attempt to dislodge the mud. He reached the first door and stopped, grunting in annoyance. The habits of his usual routine had brought him to the mill first, but the building had already been locked up for days. Events since the autumn had thrown his entire business into disarray as the patterns of industry were cast to the winds. 
The space that was filled with spears was supposed to be the ore yard for the mill, but they had long since run out of ore to process. The spears in the yard were originally in order for the royal army, but the army had been rooted on the first day of the annual skirmish with the empire and so the majority of the weapons were left unclaimed and unpaid for. The confrontation itself had been pushed back from autumn to late midwinter, upending the usual cycle of production for the city's forges. They had to switch their efforts from forging spears to rushing tools and parts for all of the duchy's territories that had suddenly found themselves with unexpected, additional manpower to perform their regular seasonal work. Then the advance orders from the Royal Army came in, forcing them to suspend the work they had switched to in order to fill the mounting demands of the nobles that were coming with their levy of hundreds of thousands of men. His grumbling turned dark as he thought of all the wasted fuel and labor. The spears were now slowly being turned into plowshares, shovels and other tools as he could do nothing but redirect his workers once again to prepare for the planting season. Sheltered in buildings out of sight and away from the streets occupied by the undead, they worked long hours into the night in the effort to reverse their bad fortune. The faint sound of an approaching wagon turned his attention away from his grousing. He left the door to the mill and jogged across the yard to the main gate, unlatching it and pushing it open slightly before heading to the warehouse nearby. He grabbed a clipboard that was hanging just inside the entrance of the building and turned around just as the sound of the approaching vehicle stopped in the alley on the other side of the wall. A shadow separated from the one cast by the wagon, which was shortly joined by a second. Isprint straightened his posture as light steps approached the gate. Rather than a merchant and his assistant or a pair of noble retainers, however, two finely dressed women slipped in through the opening provided. The first was a moderately tall and slender young woman in her teens. Her forest green dress with few flourishes gave the impression that she was attempting to balance a feminine appearance with an outfit functional for more mundane activities. The second woman projected an image which eclipsed the firsts. Though she only stood below her companion's shoulder, she had a stunning appearance that would have drawn longing gazes everywhere she went. Her own outfit seemed incalculably valuable an elaborate ballroom gown seemingly woven from silken shadows that devoured the evening light. Their attire was in stark contrast to the rough and dirty surroundings of the forge. He had not seen the second woman before, with her unforgettable appearance, he would have had to have gone senile to not remember her, but the first seemed familiar somehow. After considering that she was just barely an adult, he was finally able to put a name to her face. She was taller since the last time he had seen her. Hmm. There's a Radnik girl, isn't it? His voice came out gruffly, in that fancy dress that your brothers complained about too. Here to use your allowance to buy a spear this time? Surprise briefly passed over her face at his recognition before she smiled slightly and spoke. My brothers must have said something memorable for you to remember that. Isbrint grunted and he scratched the stubble on his cheek. The girl had a disposition much like her father's, casually receiving his jabs and returning with an unruffled reply. Her companion showed no reaction either way, scanning the contents of the yard as if a workshop lot was an uncommon thing. So, what are you here for? he asked. I need to purchase tools and parts, she replied. Do you have any in stock? Upon hearing her request, he sucked in his lips and stood in silence for a while. That she had come personally without any of her family seemed like bad news. Considering the fate of most of the royal army that winter, well, it was probably better left unspoken, he was already worried that he had unwittingly slighted her by reopening recent wounds, unaware of her family's fate. I see. He finally replied as he turned around to pull open the warehouse doors, well, take your pick. The space inside was filled with equipment, tools and parts for all sorts of labor. The women looked about silently as he continued speaking. It's already spring, but no one's come to buy anything, he explained as he led them through the building. Plenty of nobles should have sent in their orders by now and we'd be pushing our goods out non-stop, but production's about to stall for lack of proper storage since no one actually is. It looks like your workshop is still running, though, Lady Zaradnik said as she handed her order to him and turned to motion for someone in the direction of the gate to bring in her wagon. A forge is expensive to run, is Brent replied as he looked it over, can't just stop halfway and pick things up the next day. We were going to keep working till the current batch of fuel was out, but it looks like we're gonna have a bit more space available after this order here. He turned to walk away before he even finished his sentence, heading out the opposite end of the warehouse and into the smithy. 
Hey Satch, he spoke to the first body he came across, get some of the guys and help load this wagon. Yes, Forge Master, the young journeyman replied. Muffled voices could be heard shortly after, and several other journeymen appeared, along with a handful of apprentices. One pushed a cart into the room and the others sat about while listening to his instructions. They worked together to move the first of two wide gang plows that were on the young noblewoman's order. They were wrought from iron, and it took several minutes to move. The group got about as far as the exit of the warehouse to the yard before they found themselves facing two undead, death knights, if he had heard correctly from the procession some days ago, as well as some sort of horse creature hitched to the wagon. The two groups stared at each other for a good three seconds before his employees backed away and turned around as one, leaving the cart with the plow behind. The forge master sighed as Lady Zaradnik directed the death knights to load the plow onto the wagon. Sorry for the trouble, he apologized. I suppose it was to be expected, she said. It is already quite a feat to have working staff at all. The ones you see are all live-in apprentices and journeymen. They've been able to ignore what's going on outside busying themselves with work. They'll probably end up doing that as long as they have something to distract themselves with. Isbrunt felt a bit dissatisfied as he spoke about his employees. It seemed rather shameful that these two women were able to function normally, the undead even seemed to be working for them, while his own men were basically carrying on by denying reality. Sooner or later they would have to face it, and he wasn't sure how things would pan out. The first of the plows had already been securely loaded by the time the next one was rolled out on another cart. The two groups somehow alternated to avoid contact with one another as they continued delivering tools to the wagon. I am just glad I could find someone to purchase equipment from, the young noblewoman said as the three of them watched the strange dance going on in front of them. Once the other nobles get back to managing their fiefs, you might have a monopoly on their business. The forge master snorted. If only it was that easy, he replied. A big noble like Jesnor Fassett could clean out my entire inventory ten times over in one trip and still come back for more later. I don't even have the raw materials with all of the trade dried up. Even though the other forges might not all be working, they're still hoarding what they have left. He pointed over to a different part of the yard, where the thousands of iron spears were laid out, covering most of the open space along the far wall. Only thing that'll probably keep us going are all the unclaimed weapons that the Royal Army didn't pick up, he said. They ordered them to replace lost or broken equipment for the month or so that they expected to be here for, but now we'll have to melt them back down and recast them for lack of ore. Did they pay you for the spears? The Baroness asked. Nope. Just have to make do. The city's feeding the people for free right now, so at least we got one less thing to worry about. Want to buy one? Lady Zaradnik replied after considering his offer for a moment. Now that you mention it, yes. A few other things as well, if you have them. Ha! Huh. Guess I was right when you came in, after all. Isbrunt led the group away through the complex as the wagon continued to be loaded, taking them between the buildings towards the back door of the closed shop that faced the street. It was propped open by a large stone, but the interior was not lit. He strode in without slowing hitting the service bell with his palm as he passed the sales counter and walked straight to the storefront to open the wooden shutters. He unleashed a great amount of clattering, curses and stomping about as he moved across the windows to open the locked shutters facing the street. Most of the store was a showroom for equipment, suits of all types of armor as well as a variety of weapons displayed in the rows. He returned to the counter and slapped the bell again, and when there was still no response he started hitting it repeatedly. Muffled yelling could be heard from above, but he kept striking the bell. Finally there was the sound of someone coming down the stairs in a rush and the sound of the bell stopped. A man in his twenties looking half asleep came down out of the stairwell and immediately started shouting. The hell is wrong with you, you fat sack of sh. Customer. Is Brent cut him off, anticipating his outburst. With business as it was, his shop clerk had turned into an inactive lump sleeping most of his days away. The man on the stairwell abruptly cut off his words mid-sentence, looking to the group, back to the forge master, then back again. He finished his descent while tucking in his shirt and grabbed a worker's hat to cover his unruly head of hair. Putting his palms together, he seemed uncertain what to say after his coarse display. Feel free to take a look around, the forge master filled in for him. This guy'll take care of you if you find something. 
As the two noble women browsed the aisles, the man stepped out from behind the counter to follow. Isbrunt folded his arms and leaned against the doorframe leading to the back as he watched them. Lady Zaradnik stopped to take a spear from a rack that lay against the near wall. The smooth wooden haft of the pole arm was as tall as she was, with a steel blade that extended an additional forty centimeters. You use a spear? There was a pleasant-sounding voice as her companion spoke for the first time, but his Brent frowned when a dubious expression appeared on the girl's face as she examined the weapon. It reminded him very much of a prideful noble that looked down on equipment that did not strike their fancy. Our entire village was trained to use them, my lady, Lady Zaradnik replied as she placed the spear back and examined another, we found ourselves fighting monsters and beasts perhaps more than demi-humans, they are well suited to dealing with those problems. As Isprint pondered who the girl that Lady Zaradnik was deferring to might be, he saw her eyes go to the spear that the taller woman had just rested back on its stand. She examined it with that same, dubious expression for a while before her delicate, gloved hand reached up towards the blade of the spear. The forge master straightened from where he was leaning to warn her of the sharpness of the blade. Before he could, however, he saw her pinch it between two fingers. It bent suddenly at a ninety-degree angle, then was just as suddenly straight again. If the girl had not been surreptitiously peeking about after the fact with a guilty look on her face, he would have sincerely doubted what had just happened. The shop clerk was too preoccupied gazing at the women from behind and had not noticed what had happened to the poor spear. When his eyes met with hers, she offered an innocent smile as she put the spear back on its mount and the clerk's expression slackened in a ridiculous way until Isbrunt walked up to slap him upside the back of his head. He gave the clerk a glare after the man turned on him with a hurtful expression and, by the time they looked back to the aisle, the two nobles had disappeared around the corner. The spear which had been mysteriously bent and unbent was missing from its place on the weapon rack. Over the displays he could see the points of two spears being carried to the clerk's desk, so as Brent turned around to see what had happened after Lady Zaradnik laid them upright against the counter. While this spear in particular was a weapon that one might find commonly wielded by the city militia, it was still forged out of good steel and by no means of poor quality. As he peered at the spearhead, he could see the line where the metal had been stressed and shook his head in puzzlement as he ran his fingers over the surface of the blade. The only reasoning he could come up with was that she was a powerful individual from some far-flung place, much like the adventurer Momen. It would certainly explain how such a delicate-looking girl could brave the streets of the city without the slightest hint of worry. Over the next half hour, an assortment of equipment built up around the sales counter. A large round shield rested against the two spears and a few sidearms lay on the table, one battle axe, a hatchet and a long dagger. Two bow staves of different draw weights and lengths lay beside them alongside an open-faced sallet with a hinged visor. Several other pieces of armor were set aside as well, gauntlets, braces, a gorget and greaves along with an undyed gambesine. It was a familiar selection that he had seen regularly, aside from the common armament of her territory. There were also many choices shared by adventurers and other fighting individuals that expected to spend significant amounts of time in the forested regions beyond the tamed lands of the duchy. A few other things, huh? They were, necessary purchases, Lady Zaradnik smiled sheepishly at his remark. I always thought it'd be nice if my wife shared more of the same interests as me, the forge master mused, but, looking at you here, I don't think I'd have anything left for myself if that were true. This store seems to have everything, Lady Zaradnik remarked as the clerk tallied the bill. Was it always like this? Several workshops decided to display their wares using a few combined storefronts last winter, the clerk explained. It seems to net more sales overall and save room between all of the different vendors. Is there an armorsmith included in your number? The Baroness asked, I would like to order mail and a coat of plates as well. We do forge armor here, Isbrun answered, but we won't be free to work on anything until early summer, well, at least if the other nobles start showing up and buying things. It was not uncommon for nobles to push their demands onto them, though it was usually limited to a handful of individuals in the more powerful houses. The young noblewoman filled in as his words trailed off hesitantly. I will be back after I get my laborers started, she said. There are several other things I need to look into, but we are already a week into the planting season. Of course, the clerk replied with a slight bow. Then we will be looking forward to your patronage. When the clerk was finished with the bill for her equipment, and the cost of the damaged spear, 
Isbrand held out the order form she had handed to him upon their meeting. Here's the tally for the tools out back, they should be done loading by now, he said. If you're headed that way, I'd appreciate it if you dropped it off at the Merchant Guild. I don't mind, though perhaps you could return the favor by doing something for us. And what's that? Keep your storefront open, the Baroness said. Just like it is right now. Isbrunt looked at the noble woman strangely, then looked out towards the open shutters and the empty streets beyond. You are open for business, yes? She pressed her request. We are, he answered slowly, still trying to make sense of why she had asked, well, there's nothing to lose now, I guess, and this lazy lout needs to stop sleeping the days away. I'll do as you ask, Baroness. The rains found D. Rantle once again in the night, assailing the city's roofs and streets, walls and plazas as it often did in the spring. As the torrent washed the dust of the day away, lightning would occasionally make its presence known, followed by a low rumble of thunder that rattled the manor windows in their frames. Within the darkened room of the manor's solar, a singular figure brooded on a lavish couch, the flashes coming through the windows offering occasional glimpses of his unflinching appearance. Pandora's actor once again spent most of the day in the countryside, revisiting the towns and villages that lined the main highway from Erantel to the Riestai's border. He had just recently returned from the furthest town in Fassett County, where the people had brought him to the largest tavern and detained him with an endless stream of toasts and propositions well into the evening. His role as Momen in the past few weeks was simple to perform, yet, as those weeks passed, he had come to understand that it was an arduous task as well. There were dozens of towns and villages that served as the centers of their respective fiefs and hundreds of other settlements scattered throughout the territories. The guardian overseer kept dispatching Momen and Nobe out to the more distant fiefs in particular, as well as those communities along the main thoroughfares where information could traverse rapidly. Albedo had not voiced the reason behind these dispatches, but he knew well the root of her concerns. The pall of fear still hung over the duchy, and constant vigilance was required to keep the flames of panic from igniting anew, creating a mass exodus akin to the one that had occurred while Erantel was still being formally ceded to the sorceress kingdom. The source of the panic did not even matter, it would enter into the existing tension like a spark into so much kindling, taking on a life of its own. Their shortfalls in this task were made painfully clear by the restrictions that had been placed on them and frustrations continued to mount, it was as if their master had, in a single elegant stroke of a brush, made plain all of their weaknesses and withdrew into seclusion to allow Nazarick Stenison's time to address them. Even he had not escaped unscathed from that masterful stroke. The citizens had no trust in their new sovereign or his servants. The only individual that had earned universal recognition and respect was the persona established by their master, the Dark Warrior, Momen. However, as Pandora's actor revisited the places where his previous journeys had taken him, he was dismayed to find that his efforts appeared temporary and limited, a short-lived wave of hopeful emotion created through the excitement generated by his presence. According to the escorts and observers assigned to perform reconnaissance around him, the people remained close to their dwellings even as he came calling, and returned to them not long after he left. Whatever courage he inspired, whatever sense of security, seemed only ever enough to sustain their fearful watchfulness from within the perceived safety of their homes. Between all of the efforts of his fellow NPCs, little headway had been made, they provided for the people, made sure they were safe and created the mechanisms in which to secure productive and prosperous lives. Yet, even after occasionally being coaxed out to see what had been established for their benefit, the citizens were still wrapped up in their fear and anxiety. It felt like he was playing to an audience that refused to receive him in earnest and the creeping sense that he was slowly, but inevitably, losing the battle to keep their fears at bay haunted him, that the spell cast upon the people by his master, the enchantment that was the legend of Momen, would surely break at some point and its undoing would be his own doing. That Pandora's actor might fail in his act created a disquieting sensation that rose from the depths of his being, and it sometimes felt as if he could hear the footsteps of failure stalking in his shadow. And so he brooded. Unlike some pose that he might have struck because it fancied his tastes, he brooded in earnest and the sense of authenticity only whetted his flair for the dramatic even more, moment of darkness, brooding darkly in the darkness. The rain continued to lash against the manor and lightning clashed outside. He thought that the only thing that could add to the perfection of this scene was for a horrifying monster to come crawling in through the window. Then, 
as if the world itself had catered to his whims. The next flash of lightning cast an additional shadow, its distorted silhouette displaying itself starkly on the patterned wall which he faced. He rose abruptly and turned to see the figure of Shiltier blood fallen floating outside, blurred by the water that washed down the glass panes. As he went to unlatch the window and opened it out into the night, he noted that she cradled a large bottle in one of her gloved hands while holding her dark parasol in the other. Shaking away the depressing threads of thought from his mind, he made to welcome his late-night guest. One of the beautiful courtiers of the Sorceress Kingdom has come in the dead night to the bedroom window of the hero of Eranthal, bearing a bottle of liquor, no less. This should surely be a source of the most scandalous gossip. The vampire expressed no reaction to his greeting as the wind tossed at her hair and gown. Well, please do come in, he stepped aside and bowed, sweeping his left arm towards the interior of the room. You are most welcome in my humble abode, dear Fräulein. Shiltia made her way into the room, unequipping the black parasol as Pandora's actor received the bottle and closed the window behind her. As she seated herself on the couch across from the one where he had been brooding, he produced two fine crystal goblets and placed them lightly on the table between them. With a flourish, he wiped away the droplets of moisture that had collected on the bottle with a fine linen cloth and uncorked it, leaning forward as he filled the vessels before him. He offered one of the glasses to his guest before seating himself opposite to her. Bringing his own goblet forward, he sampled the aroma of the beverage while rolling the dark liquor lightly. Its fragrance marked it as a beverage procured from Nazarick, holding little similarity to the wines produced in Eranthal which were derived from the fruit of their local vineyards. There was another scent, however, one that had immediately caught his attention as she glided past upon entering the room. That fragrance you wear, he noted after taking a sip from his goblet, is not from Nazarick, is it? My vampire brides picked it out today, she replied. From a perfumer in the city. Shiltair produced a tiny crystal vial from her inventory, laying it on the table between them. Pandora's actor reached out to retrieve the item, leaning back into his chair as he examined the offered article. Oh. Interesting, isn't it de Shiltia remarked, even in their weakness, they find ways to create unexpected strength with what little power they have. The vial was cleverly constructed, its size and structure made it difficult to accidentally break. In addition, it was imbued with a minor enchantment that gave it nearly negligible damage reduction. Combined with its physical qualities, he questioned whether even tossing it from the window out onto the pavement would have broken the item. Any chips or cracks that did occur would simply repair themselves due to its nature as a magic item, as insignificant as the enchantment was. In the everyday life that this perfume vial was meant to see, it was practically indestructible, one would have to go out of their way to purposely destroy it. It's an innovative use of low-tier enchantment, I agree, yet the content itself is also most curious, Pandora's actor turned the vial in his fingers. I can hardly imagine that this would be a popular fragrance amongst humans. This individual has not only created a practical low-tier magic item but, in a short period of time, has successfully devised a fragrance that seems to be quite suited to the undead, to whom I can only presume they plan on marketing this perfume towards. He returned the vial to the table. It seems that there are many gems hidden in this land, he said lightly, if one only knows where to look. How much did you know? The shift in Chiltia's previously conversational tone gave him pause. Across from him, she held her goblet between her fingers. Her head was tilted slightly and her chin was raised as her crimson gaze bore down on him through half-lidded eyes. She was much shorter than he was, but her imperious posture very much lent to the feeling that she was looking down at him as she spoke. Pandora's actor once again leaned back onto the sofa, unperturbed, stretching his arms wide over its ornate oaken frame as he responded. Now then, I know a great many things, he replied in a cavalier tone. Sometimes I surprise even myself with the depth of knowledge that I've been instilled with. The noble that you brought to the attention of the others yesterday, Shiltir's voice did not change, cutting cleanly through his cryptic preamble, Baroness Saradnik. Just how much did you know about her before you brought her existence to our attention? I didn't lie when I delivered my thoughts on her potential usefulness yesterday, he shrugged lightly. Though your apparent concern shortly after having her come into your care makes it sound like you've something to share, did something happen? Too much has happened, she snapped, sitting up to peer at him suspiciously. 
enough to make me believe that I've been entwined in someone else's schemes to aren't you? Shilti's behavior suggested that the piece that he had put into play had done something extraordinary in her eyes, to a degree that perhaps exceeded his initial expectations. He had cast a die on the matter of the young baroness at the previous evening's council meeting, but he had certainly not expected significant returns on his gambit within a day. Then let us go over what causes you to believe this to be the case, Pandora's actor leaned forward, folding his hands in front of him. I would very much like to hear of your experiences with this human. Seeing that she would get no direct answer to her suspicions, Shiltir settled into her seat and began to speak at length about the past day. She spoke of her first encounter, their journey through the streets and time in the alley, the discussion of that evening, of her time in the civil office and the day they had spent traversing Erantel to make connections, secure capital and begin her efforts to rebuild her domain. She spoke of the noble woman's personality and conduct, the interactions she had with others, and even her cursory thoughts on the future of the sorceress kingdom. Throughout her account, Pandora's actor had her stop to clarify various details. He had her expand on her feelings during those experiences, the atmosphere they carried and her observations of the scenes that surrounded them. He beseeched her to share her thoughts on the events that occurred and he would have her hold so he could digest her words and think quietly on their meaning. The night grew long as they sat across from one another and spoke, the bottle of liquor slowly draining away. Even after her words ran dry he remained seated, deep in thought, reviewing what she had said. The way you describe it, he murmured thoughtfully, she appears to possess some mysterious power beyond our comprehension. She does have powers, which makes it all the worse because, but for a single case, she hasn't really used them to directly achieve any of her ends in any meaningful way. I've been with her for most of her waking hours, observing and asking questions. The administrative systems that Albedo has prepared are as simple to understand for her as Albedo claimed they would be to any of these humans. The tasks that Baroness Saradnik set before herself were done in the mundane order and manner that she described. Interactions, discussions, transactions and even small talk were nothing if not normal. In the space of a single day to Aaron Shu, she has accomplished in her own small way what none of us could in a week. She navigates this absurd human society with no more difficulty than you or I would walk through the floors of Nazarick. As she makes her way, everything seems to naturally shift into place, obstacles are only detours, pieces of the puzzle grow legs and walk over to where they need to be. All that she understands and does works in the same way as we ourselves understand their workings, yet she is able to do what we haven't been able to despite our own best efforts. It is as if we all have the exact same key to the exact same lock to the exact same door, yet only she knows how to open it to aren't you. It was as he had suspected. While not exactly noted for her intellect, Shiltir's intuition was extraordinarily keen compared to most of the other NPCs. In his own travels with Nobe throughout the lands of the New Realm, Pandora's actor also felt that there was something missing, even while he played his role as the Dark Warrior. It was akin to lifting a tablecloth the size of a nation at a single point. Once he let go and moved on to lift the next point, the part of the fabric that he had raised up simply returned to the surface of the table and ultimately nothing would change. Though she might not be able to articulate her thoughts concisely, Shiltir seemed to have surpassed that understanding in the short time she had taken responsibility for the young noblewoman through experience and intuition alone. Pandora's act arose from his seat to pace back and forth across the red carpet beyond the seats in the room. He cradled an elbow in one hand and his chin in his other and occasionally stopped to motion vaguely into the air as various thoughts came across his mind. Sometimes he slowed as if to speak, then abandoned the idea and continued his pacing. Shiltir absently reached for the bottle to refill her glass, but she found that it had been completely emptied and it made a hollow noise when she placed it back onto the table. Did you tell her something? Teach her some secret, perhaps? Her queries prodded him from his thoughts, or did I in summer instruct you to do this? The latter part of her string of questions held a hint of jealousy within them, since the founding of the Sorceress Kingdom. Their master had kept himself mostly secluded from his servants so his attention was at an even greater premium than it usually was. No, he responded as he stopped his pacing to answer her. Our master gave me no direct instructions on this matter, though one may consider it a rough extension of the role I play as moment to help stabilize the realm. 
My interactions with the young Baroness have been non-existent since she and I parted ways before the council meeting yesterday. I only admonished her to keep her reactions to what she observed with her talent in check as to not disrupt the lives of the citizens of the realm, appealing to her orderly disposition. Well, she certainly seemed to take your words to heart, she barely reacts to anything, Shulte aside. Then the truth of her work eludes us, it is as if all the mechanisms of this world only respond to her act aren't you? Pandora's actor stepped forward to begin pacing anew, then he stopped and suddenly rounded on the vampire reclining on the couch. What did you just say? He asked her quietly.